Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series has been, because we're now studying the very last lesson, entitled Present Truths of Deuteronomy. And this is the very last chapter. The focus is the last chapter of Deuteronomy on the resurrection of Moses. It's lesson number 13 for December 25 of 2020. We hope you all have a great Christmas. As usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you now. We thank you not only for sending your son and all that that has mean, meant to us, but for the great life and teachings and writings of Moses. Now, as we consider what we can learn from his death and his resurrection, help us to be guided by your Holy Spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have discovered in this quarter that the book of Deuteronomy consists of four separate sermons. Uh, three speeches by Moses and a sort of appendix, which some regard as a fourth sermon or so forth speech. Obviously, the report of his death was not written by Moses. And that, of course, would be in chapter, last part of chapter 34. Much of Deuteronomy is reported Moses' work with the children of Israel over the past 40 years. In almost every case, Moses acted in a way that one would expect God to act. He was a very competent, reliable, and loved leader. We now come to the end of Deuteronomy with it description of the end of the life of Moses. And we will pick up with the first comment from Ellen White. Moses knew that he was to die alone. No earthly friend would be permitted to minister to him in his last hours. There was mystery and awfulness about the scene before him, from which his heart shrank. The severest trial was his separation from the people of his care and love the people who, with whom his interests and his life had so long been united. But he had learned to trust in God, and the questioning, excuse me, the unquestioning faith he comment, committed himself and his people to his love and mercy. Ellen White, Patriarch, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 470. Okay. What can we learn about God from the life and approaching death of Moses? The most obvious thing to talk about is the fact that nobody buried him except God. And then he was resurrected from the dead. That's a very, very unusual situation. You wonder, did God say anything to him when he said, climb up the mountain and you're going to die up there? Did God give him any hint about who was going to accompany him? Now, we just read, no human accompaniment. Did, he, did God imply to him at all that maybe... God himself would accompany him? We just don't know. Yeah. But to pick up our story earlier, to figure out how we got to this place, we need to go back and remember what happened at Kadesh, near the end of their 40 years. God and Moses, acting on God's behalf, had been incredibly gracious to the very rebellious and undeserving Israelites on many, many occasions. Imagine having your food provided without any major effort on your part and water provided by God every day just automatically. Paul commented on that in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, as we know, when he said, the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. So who is responsible for the free water and the free food? Christ. Christ himself. And... I mean, Moses certainly knew that. Aaron must and certainly knew that. D didn't they get that message too to the people? I mean, they, I mean, did they really think maybe that Moses and Aaron were somehow able to create this water and this food? Surely they're not that foolish. I think there was even more. Every day there is a shadow. The, whenever the cloud moved, they moved. And at night it became a pillar of fire. I mean, what did the people around them think? These are yeah. a million people walking. Was it million or a couple of million people walking? Yeah. And what a sight. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There had to be spies from the other nations that were yeah. up on the mountaintops or hilltops right. watching them. Watching them. Yeah. Yeah. Who's coming to invade our country? Yeah. 
Carrie? Ellen White commented, wherever in their journeyings they wanted water, there from the cliffs of the rock it gushed out beside their encampment. That's from Patriots and Prophets, uh, page 411, paragraph 1. But then they arrived at Kadesh, and look at the story in Numbers 20, 1 to 13. Gordon, you want to pick that up? So, reading from Good News Bible, In the first month the whole community of Israel came to the wilderness of Zin and camped at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Was this the first time they had been at Kadesh? I don't, I don't believe so. so. What happened the last time they were at Kadesh? Or Kadesh, some people say Kadesh. What was it, quail? No, I thought you all would be right on top of this one. The name was... That's where they sent in the spies. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. okay. That's where they sent in the spies and had that disaster. Okay, so this is south of Israel then? This is, this is just south of what would end up being Judean territory in the Sinai Desert. Yeah. Verse 2, there was no water where they camped, so the people gathered round Moses and Aaron and complained, it would have been better if we had died in front of the Lord's tent along with our fellow Israelites. And interrupting again, what are they talking about that there? The rebellion and... Of Korah, uh, Dathan, and Abiram. Well, the earth opened up and swallowed them. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is crazy. We'd have been better off dead, they were saying. Yeah. Uh, verse 4, why have you brought us out into this wilderness? Just so that we can die here with our animals? Why did you bring us out of Egypt into this miserable place where nothing will grow? There is no corn, no figs, no grapes, no pomegranates. There is not even any water to drink, although they'd been drinking water the whole time. Exactly. From, straight from God. Moses and Aaron moved away from the people and stood at the entrance to the tent. They bowed down with their faces to the ground, and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence appeared to them. Mm. The Lord said to Moses, Take the stick that is in front of the covenant box. Now let's interrupt for just a second. What stick was in front of the covenant box? Moses' rod. Aaron's rod, Aaron's rod. Sorry. that had budded and right. borne almonds overnight. Yeah, overnight. Yeah. Overnight. Budded and borne almonds. Now he's taken this stick, which I presume the buds and the almonds were still there. I assume they were. I don't know for sure. He's taken this stick out and he's going to use it. Well, he'd used it before to yeah. strike the rock. To well, we don't know for sure that he used, used that stick previously. He and struck it. A stick. A stick. And the Lord said to Moses, Take the stick that is in front of the covenant box, and then you and Aaron assemble the whole community. There in front of all of them, speak to that rock over there, and water will gush out of it. In this way, you will bring water out of the rock for the people, for them and their animals to drink. Moses went and got the stick as the Lord had commanded. Okay, now let me interrupt again. Is it possible that some of the people actually might have thought that if you strike a rock, water would come out of it? Maybe. I hope they wouldn't be that foolish, but maybe they thought so. So God says, well, don't strike it, just speak to it. If you strike it with the right rod. <laughs> with, with, with your diamond pick or something, huh? You go ahead, I'm sorry. Verse 10, he and Aaron assembled the whole community in front of the rock, and Moses said, listen, you rebels, do we have to get water out of this rock for you? Then Moses raised the stick and struck the rock twice with it, and a great stream of water gushed out, and all the people and animals drank. But the Lord reprimanded Moses and Aaron. He said, Because you did not have enough faith to acknowledge my holy power before the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land that I promised to give them. This happened at Meribah, where the people of Israel complained against the Lord and where he showed them that he was holy. Good News Bible. Okay. It's certainly not too difficult to understand the dynamics of the situation. For years, Moses had been leading them through all their troubles. 
There they were next to the land of Canaan, having received their food and water every day at the hand of the Lord. And then because the water seemed to be delayed, the people were complaining and complaining. Shouldn't it have been obvious that it was God's activities and not the activities of Moses and Aaron, which provided water for them? Had they come to actually believe that Moses and Aaron were the ones providing water for them? Of course, it's, you know, you can't go very long without water. No. Three or four food days you you're in without, trouble. But water, no. some of us can go longer without food than others. <laughs> well, because we have some stored up, huh? That's right. The sad part is that Moses almost began to reflect that idea. So what do you think? Was Moses angry? Was he frustrated? Or, or what? Maybe both. Yeah, maybe both. Moses knew perfectly well that he had no power to bring water out of any rock. How often are we tempted to do something in a fit of anger or frustration? Could we learn to stop, pray, and seek God? Seek God's will before we do anything like that? The big question in Numbers 20, which we just read, was, why did God say that Moses and Aaron's problem was that they lacked faith? What does that have to do with bringing water out of a rock? He told them to talk, didn't he? They banged them. He used yeah. a stick, but he told them to talk to the rock. Yeah. Okay. Numbers 20, 12, and 13. But the Lord reprimanded Moses and Aaron. He said, because you did not have enough faith to acknowledge my holy power before the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land that I promised to give you. This happened at uh, Meribah, where the people of Israel com uh, complained. complained against the Lord and where he showed them that he was holy, good in his Bible. Okay. And later in the book, we have these comments that might add some light to that. Deuteronomy 31, 2, Moses said, I am now 120 years old and I'm no longer able to be your leader. Now, that wasn't because, as we're, we're going to find out later, because he was something wrong with his eyes or his mind was slipping or anything like that. We're going to, you know, he's as clear as anything. But why was it that he could, could not any longer be their reader, leader? Because he misrepresented God. God said, no, not so. He can't do it. Once somewhat, he asked, the Lord asked him to strike the rock once. Yes. That was the first time. Yeah, yeah that, that was, was the first, first time. But yeah. Uh, this time, he, uh, to me, I think he was just upset with these different yeah. people. You know. uh, so, and besides this, the Lord had told me that I will not cross the Jordan. That's from our Good News Bible also. And Deuteronomy 34, verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, This is the land that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I would give it to their descendants. I have let you see it, but I will not let you go there. And remember that, that Moses had written out carefully and in, in this early alphabet version of things from Genesis 1 1 to the end of Deuteronomy maybe short of a few verses he had carefully written that out and he'd written many times God has promised this land to Abraham Isaac and Jacob's descendants and now after spending 40 years leading the children right up to the to the edge of that land several times and finally going all the way around in around this and back and forth he was not going to be able to go in wow the children of israel had come to regard moses as a god figure he was the one who went into the tent he was the one that went to the top of the mountain and they came to think that whatever moses said or did was exactly what god would have done so how does that relate to faith jim the children of Israel had come to regard Moses as a God figure. Yeah, you just dropped down a paragraph. Oh, well, okay. Faith is just a word we use to denote a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. We cannot say... Will be. Will be because we remember the story of Lucifer. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deep admiration. 
It means having enough confidence in him based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe whatever he says, as soon as we are sure he is the one saying it, to accept whatever he offers as soon as we are sure he is the one offering it, and to do whatever he wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith is perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means that, like Abraham, Job, and Moses... And our friend Moses here. Mm. Go ahead. God's friend, friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. Graham Maxwell, can God be trusted? No, you can trust You can trust the Bible, page 81. Yeah. And there's some, we added the portions in brackets there because um, he didn't actually put that part in his book, but he stated that many times in, in class. So we, we all understand that, hopefully. So now, there's a very comprehensive, very good definition of faith. Let's go back to our question. Why did God say that, say that Aaron and, Mi and Moses had lacked faith? How would that relate? Okay, now let's, let's think about Moses' earlier experience. When God told him, okay, let me kill all these other people, Moses, and I will make a great nation out of you. And what did Mo how did Moses respond? Strike my name out of. Well, before... Said, God, you couldn't do that. It would ruin your reputation. Yeah, first of all. And then he says, if you can't do that, well then, maybe I don't, I don't, I don't want to wish be with a God like that either. You know, it's just going to change like that. So, here he is, after being un understanding God so well and trying to speak up for God's reputation. And here he is, instead of speaking up for God's reputation, trying to hold up God, he's misrepresenting God. Step back for a moment. Think about the larger context. The people had been rebellious and disobedient again and again and again during those 40 years. Meanwhile, Moses had stood up firmly and faithfully for God. He had carried out God's will many, many times. And on this occasion, God had told Moses just to speak to the rock. Remember that on a previous occasion, this has already been mentioned, when they complained about not having enough water, Moses had been told to strike the rock and water poured out. That's back in Exodus 17, 6. On that occasion, Moses had followed God's instructions. But on this occasion, Moses was told to speak to the rock. Now, one of the things that has been suggested is that um, this is a symbolism of, of God's operating on our behalf. Christ only had to die once. He didn't have to die more than once. Uh, and that symbolism, I don't know how much we should make of that. But in this Question. case, he struck the rock twice, yes. So why would God add that additional temptation or tool to Moses to have that stick in his hand? Right. Why didn't he just say, go over to the rock, walk over to that rock, the two of you, I, instead I'm, of go get the, sto the, the rod and then go to the rock? Yeah. Why, God, why would God do that? Micro, God doesn't micromanage. Is that but a, he did. An answer? He did in this in this case. He said, "Go get this, and then go there." Yeah. Go get yeah, the but, rod. But he didn't t <laughs> interpret everything <laughs> uh, on, on the ro yeah. road. You know, you can leave leave something. So, uh, or did yeah. Moses put that in? Say, "I thought I heard God say, go pick up the rod.'" No, I don't think so. I, I think he was pretty careful to put it writing down what God had actually sold him. But clearly, he wasn't supposed to strike the rock. Mm -hmm. Moses had followed God's instructions to go into the tent uh, or tabernacle and take Aaron's rod. By the way, where was that rod located? Just outside the Ark, Ark of the that Covenant. Inside. Outside, no, outside the Ark of the Covenant, it but against... inside the Most Holy Place. Yes. And Moses was supposed to just wander and then get this stick? Only once a year. That, what do we say about the high priest only going there once a year? Well, he was a Levite. Well, yeah. He wasn't the priest. No, he was, he was, he was ahead of the, the high priest, actually. <laughs> right. So God 
you know, if God tells you to do it, you do it, yeah, right? Right. Well, instead of going to the rock and speaking to it, he took that rod that had budded and borne fruit, and he struck the rock twice. Oh, my. And he broke a couple of almonds also. Oh, my <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <but. laughs> Well, the whole well, thing, though, he must have thought well of Moses overall or he wouldn't have taken him to heaven. Yeah. Well, that shows the graciousness of the Creator. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, uh... Remember then, uh, we already read that, I'm sorry. What would you have done if you had been God under those circumstances? Superficially, from a human standpoint, it seems like God was quite unfair with his friend Moses. One rash act, and he was excluded from entering the land of Canaan, which he had been hoping to, to, to do for at least 40 years. God had plans for Moses, and he knew about what those plans were through all of this. So the question which remains is, what do you think the children of Israel learned from what happened to Moses? God has a plan. He knows what's going He's planning to take Moses to a much better Canaan, not just the one across the Jordan River. But the question is, what was he trying to tell the children of Israel because of this experience? I think that Moses got a better deal. You think so? <laughs> I think so. I think he didn't have to put up with those those people for yeah, the, 40 years. Was his enough. job was done. Let's face yeah. it. You know, let someone else take over. But I also think a few hundred years later, he was with the Lord Himself. Yeah and stood on the mountain not too far from where he was standing yeah. now in Nebo. So well, let's think about some options here. Yeah. Did the people know that Moses had been told to speak to the rock and instead he had struck it twice? Probably not. We don't know. We don't know mm -hmm. if that was really true. At best it would be speculation. <laughs> yeah. If so, then it is clear that this was an obvious case of disobedience. But if they didn't know anything about it, and God, having given many laws and rules to the children of Israel, mostly through Moses, could not overlook a case of direct disobedience, especially on the, on, in his most prominent representative. The Israelites might have come to think that if one was a, as important, in a, one, if one was an important enough person like Moses, disobedience would not be really that serious. Well, try to imagine how Moses felt when God declared that he would not be allowed to enter Canaan. Was that a good day? Moses himself had written repeatedly in the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy of God's promise to Abraham's descendants that they should inherit the land. And remember, he had, God had told him down there in the land of Midian, I want you to lead my people to the land of Canaan. Then he was the leader of that group of people, but he was not going to be allowed. Do you, to, do you yeah. think that the Moses walked up that Mount Nebo feeling dejected, or did he know the presence of the Lord was with him as he walked up? Well, what would you do if God said, climb up that mountain over there and you're gonna die on top? Did he have a All heart attack up the top? <laughs> We're gonna talk about what happened there in a moment. I don't think he ever doubted. I think he walked up, and who knows? The Lord was, they were talking. Yeah. Probably. I think so. I have all the reason to believe that. I think kind of like Abraham was talking with God yeah. as, as they were on the way with Isaac yeah. to the mountain to sacrifice. And we will come back together. Yeah. I've often wondered what Moses does now. Yeah, what, do you, what is he doing now? Yeah. Maybe he's one of the 24 elders sitting on one of those 24 chairs around the, around the throne of God. Maybe, yeah. So what actually happened to Moses? I said, oh, he's my That's yours. Jude 24. Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 through 12. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Mount Pisgah, east okay. of Jericho. Let me just interrupt for a second. Was it Mount Nebo or was it Mount Pisgah? Well, you, if you know a little Hebrew, yeah, there's no problem. The name of the mountain is Nebo. Pisgah just means a peak. Oh, okay. So he's going to the peak of the mountain by the name of Nebo. Okay. 
Okay. And there the Lord showed him the whole land, the territory of Gilead, as far as north as the town of Dan. The and let me interrupt there for one more time. I, sorry to interrupt me. The town of Dan, how did, that get, how did it get the name the town of Dan? That happened hundreds of years later. But they're going, someone went back and, and put the, they, they took out the, the previous name and put in the name of Dan just because they thought people wouldn't recognize the previous name, I guess. Compilers and redactors and Yeah, editors. whatever. The, enti okay. the entire territory of Naphtali, the territories of Ephraim and Manasseh, the territory of Judah as far west as the Mediterranean Sea, the southern part of Judah and the plain that reached from Zoar to Jericho, the city of palm trees. Then the Lord said to Moses, This is the land that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I would give to their descendants. I have let you see it, but I will not let you go there. It almost sounds like he's rubbing it in, doesn't it? Moses, guess what? This is the land I promised to the descendants of Abraham, <laughs> but you don't get to go there. <laughs> So Moses, the Lord's servant, died there in the land of Moab as the Lord had said he would. The Lord buried him in a valley in Moab opposite the town of Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows the exact place of his burial. Moses was 120 years old when he died. He was as strong as ever, and his eyesight was still good. There's my verses there. Mm. The people of Israel mourned for him for 30 days in the plains of Moab. If he was alone, how did they know he was dead? I mean, he'd gone up the mountain, yeah. Mount Sinai, for 40 days yeah. and had, wasn't there. They said, maybe he's, di maybe he's dead. We need a new leader. Yeah. Well, what, what, I'm assuming that he told jo Joshua, obviously wrote the last few verses here. I, I, I have to assume that he told Joshua, okay, God has told me that I'm climbing this mountain and I'm going to die up there. That's the only thing I can assume. Yeah. Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with wisdom because Moses had appointed him to be his successor. The people of Israel obeyed Joshua and kept the commands that the Lord had given them through Moses. There was ne no, let me start again. There has never been a prophet in Israel like Moses. The Lord spoke with him face to face. No other prophet has ever done miracles and wonders like those that the Lord sent Moses to perform against the king of Egypt, his officials, and the entire country. No other prophet has been able to do the great and terrifying things that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. And that's from Good News Bible. Okay. Gordon? From Patriarchs and Prophets. In solitude, Moses, revived, er, Moses reviewed his life of vicissitudes and hardships since he turned from courtly honors and from a prospective kingdom in Egypt to cast in his lot with God's chosen people. He called to mind those long years in the desert with the flocks of Jethro, the appearance of the angel in the burning bush, and his own call to deliver Israel. Again, he beheld the mighty miracles of God's power displayed in behalf of the chosen people and his long-suffering mercy during the years of their wandering and rebellion. Notwithstanding all that God had wrought for them, notwithstanding his own prayers and labors, only two of all the adults in the vast army that left Egypt had been found so faithful that they could enter the promised land. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Did all the women over 20 die as well? We assume. I assume. You assume. It's not, it doesn't say that. Did some of the children who were less than 20 die? Well, that's possible too, yeah. probably. Okay. And yet there are other words that say that their shoes never wore out, they never got sick, their yep. clothes never wore out, but they died. Yes. As soon as, continuing, as, as Moses reviewed the results of his labor, his life of trial and sacrifice seemed to have been almost in vain. Again, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 471. The children of Israel were camped on the plain across the flooded Jordan River from Jericho. 
I say that because there's hints that it was spring spring time of the year, and back before people were drawing all the water out of the Jericho out of the Jordan River, it got. I have I have a picture at home done back in like 1930. That where that whole the, the river was so wide it covered almost the whole valley. So Moses was told to turn around, go back up the steep mountain cliff behind them into the country of Moab to the top of Mount Nebo, which is actually a kind of outcropping from the high plains above where they were camped. And there he would die, of course, after seeing the land. But before he died, he was shown what the land of Canaan would have, would have been if the children of Israel had entered it and they had prospered and followed God's will for them. In other words, he saw the land of Canaan the way it was God planned and hoped it would be. It was a beautiful land flowing with milk and honey. He viewed it from the far north down to the south with miraculous vision. With ordinary vision, it would, it would have been impossible to see all that Moses saw. So how would you like to have God as your undertaker? If he was going to do with me what he did to Moses, I would be delighted. <laughs> well, Deuteronomy 3, 34, 5, and 6 mentions that God buried him, and no one knows where his grave was to this day. Now we're going to, we're going to touch more on that a little bit later. Thus ended the central figure in the history of Israel to that point. The amazing thing is that Moses' story, the amazing, amazing thing in Moses' story is that that is not the end of his life. Yeah. Jude 9. Not even the chief angel, Michael, did this. In his quarrel with the devil, when they argued about who would have the body of Moses, Michael did not dare to condemn the devil with insulting words, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Goodness, Bible. I'm going to interrupt for a moment. What does the word Michael mean? It was like God. And it's used in the Bible in places where he's in direct conflict with the devil. So the devil is the one who wanted to be like God, and he's in conflict with the one who is like God. So that's why his name is used here. If they had translated this, fully and not just put Michael, they would have said the one who was one who was like God did not dare to condemn the devil and it would be more obvious. Is that what then um, Hebrew says? You the Hebrew know, says. You know Hebrew. In Hebrew, in right. Hebrew that's what the word that's what the word Michael means mm -hmm. in Hebrew. Either the one who is like God or who is like God. It can be a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Had not the life of Moses been marred with that one sin in failing to give God the glory of bringing water from the rock at Kadesh, he would have entered the promised land and would have been translated to heaven without seeing death. So that was God's original plan for Moses, right? But he was not, he was not long to remain in the tomb. Christ himself, with the angels who had buried Moses, came down from heaven to call forth the sleeping saint. And I... I, I, I love it when it talks about things like this. I, I imagine myself. Here's the, I'm sure, the entire universe watching. Christ comes with the small retinue of angels. They arrive here on the scene just to dig Moses out of the grave. I mean, how deep is he buried? You know, who, how much help do you need? Yeah. Anyway, I have to chuckle when I think about things like that. Contrasting I, that with the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. Two angels came and... Yep. Yeah. To him. Rolled back the tomb. Rolled back the stone and, and said, forth. come forth. Christ himself, with the angels had, who had buried Moses, came down from heaven to call forth the sleeping saint. Satan had exulted at his success. Now here's the important thing to remember in light of the great controversy. He has exulted at his success in causing Moses to sin against God and thus come under the dominion of death. The great adversary declared that the divine sentence, dust thou art, unto dust shalt thou return, Genesis 3.19, gave him possession of the dead. The power of the grave had never been broken. And all who were in the tomb he claimed as his captives, never to be released from his dark prison house. Patriarchs and Prophets 478, paragraph 2. Question. Yes. So, 
Moses had killed an Egyptian. Yes. That's not going to keep him from heaven. No. Misrepresenting God does no. keep him make keep him from the promise. Delayed land. him. Not very long. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it was in yeah. him from the earthly promised land. God is t attempting to teach people. Remember, at this time, the people were still pagans. A lot of them acting like. Uh, well, I, I, I quote Amos uh, five twenty five and following, and then uh, uh, was it uh, Acts seven with uh, Stephen? Well, am I right? Uh, well, we know that right there in on the plains of Moab, they had, they w they were there out carrying on with these Midianite women and so forth like this, worshiping the pagan gods and in sex orgies and probably getting drunk, while Moses is writing the book of Deuteronomy. Yeah. Well, it's happening. Yeah. Imagine the entire universe, including Satan and all his angel, evil angels, watching as Christ himself descended to this earth and resurrected Moses after arguing with Satan about who would have his body. So God buried him, left, had this argument, or stayed there and had this argument. I think the argument happened when he came back to this earth and Satan said, this is my territory, you stay out of here. And God, Christ says, I'm, I'm not going to waste my time arguing with you. Just step back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, remember that Satan had claimed that anyone who died belonged to him. He claimed that the land of the dead was his territory. This is the first time we are aware of that any dead person had been raised to life. Furthermore, Moses was not just raised to human life, but also he was raised to everlasting life. Satan was extremely angry. Uh, with Satan, a similar situation was in Job 1 and 2. Yeah. Satan strutting up, oh, I'm strutting around uh, on, the, on the earth. I own that place down there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Remember what it says in Isaiah 14, 14? Let's look at that for just a second. You said you would climb to the top of the clouds and be like the Almighty. That was Satan's claim, remember? This about Satan and his thinking. I will, uh, I, I'm sorry, here's the King James. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. King, New King James Version. These were the very words of Lucifer or later Satan while still in heaven. Satan wanted to take the place of God and in striking the rock again, Moses had basically tried to take the place of God as well. Let us be very clear. God would like to save every one of his children, but he cannot. Many of them would just start the great controversy all over again in heaven. So God can save only those people who are safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity. There are people that some of us know about who claim that when they get to heaven, they're going to show God their right to be there. Well, that's not the question. The question is, is it safe to have you there? Yeah. Jim? In consequence of sin, Moses had come under the power of Satan. In his own merits, he was death's lawful captive, but he was raised to a mortal life, holding his title in the name of the Redeemer. Moses came forth from the tomb, glorified and ascended with his deliverer to the city of God. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 479. For those who believe in a very evangelical, even legal plan of salvation, the resurrection of Moses and taking him to heaven poses a problem. What's the problem? He didn't go to heaven right after his death. No, the, no. Well, the problem is, if Christ hasn't died yet, no. How can which he hasn't he had, paid the price yet? How can it be possible that Moses is able to go to heaven? Yeah, he's clearly a sinner. He was a murderer. This, we, he, we, we can't claim that he was not a sinner, but God just took him to heaven. And he he says, you know, so it means you and don't. I, the price doesn't have to be paid for you in order to go to heaven. Oh dear. Did I say goes, that? That goes against the evangelical thinking. Yeah. There's a whole lot of stuff against it. The belief is that it was, is the death of Christ paying the price for our sins that allows God to take sinners to heaven. 
but Moses is someone who died and was resurrected and taken to heaven before any of that had actually happened. Christ himself did it. Could it be that Moses was taken to heaven because God knew after a lot of testing in, in, before the entire universe, I'm sure everybody in the universe, every time there was a, a serious interaction between God and Moses, their eyes were glued on that. Yeah, but uh, uh, it wasn't, you said testing. It's not for God's information. No, no. no it's, I, it's for demonstration, sure. teach education of the heavenly universe. Yeah, that was my point. My yeah, point was that just every time there was an interaction between God and Moses, the whole universe was watching. So God, God has it for in his foreknowledge, and I don't know what finite being in time and space can l explain what the limits are of the infinite one. Yeah. So God had directly said in Job, Job has said of me what's right. Mm -hmm. Why didn't Job get taken to heaven? Well. Or did he? Yeah, we don't know that. We don't have any evidence of it. Uh, anyway, it, is not because, it was not because Christ had already somehow paid the price for his sins. Christ had not yet come to this earth. Looking at the overall picture, would anyone not have chosen to be taken to the heavenly Canaan instead of the earthly Canaan? So if Moses had been given a choice, he probably would have chosen that. I'm sure he would have chosen that anyway. We know from Genesis 5.24 that earlier Enoch had been taken to heaven. Uh, in a, in a, let's see, but he had not died. Later we know that Elijah was taken to heaven in a fiery chariot, but he had not died either. 2 Kings 2, 11. We do not know how long Moses was dead. Probably not for long because God, no doubt, was excited to continue the, the Moses story. However, we do know that the time period from his death to his resurrection passed instantly for Moses, as far as Moses was concerned, whether it was a matter of minutes or a matter of years did not matter. Most of us have the option of doing God's will and of being resurrected on the, at the second coming of Christ and taken to heaven for the millennium. Those who will be left behind, designated as the wicked, will not be raised until the third coming, at which time, after a brief period following Satan in his attempts to conquer the New Jerusalem, they will perish forever in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul was answering a group of Christians to whom it had been suggested that Jesus had not been raised from the dead. And what did Paul say? Carrie, I think that's... Oh, sorry, I was just thinking along with what you were saying. First Corinthians, I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 13 through 22. If that is true, it means that Christ was not raised. And if Christ had not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. More than that, we are shown to be lying about God because we said that he raised Christ from death. But if it is true that the dead are not raised to life, then he did not raise Christ. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion and you are still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in all the world. Let me interrupt there for a moment. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but let me just say it right here. I don't completely agree with Paul's statement there. I think Christians can live the best live right, lives right, right here and now. Go ahead. As well as in the... As well as in the future. But the truth is that Christ has been raised from the death as a guaranteed that those who sleep of a man, no, hang on, sleep in death will also be raised. For just as death came by means of a man, in the same way the rising from death comes by means of a man. For just as all people die because of their union with Adam, in the same way all will be raised to life because of their union with Christ. And that's Amen. The Good News Bible. How important is the promise of the resurrection to you? Would you, be, would you live a Christian life if there were no resurrection? 
Do you feel, as Paul apparently did, that there would be no hope at all without a resurrection? Or is it also possible that living a Christian life is the best kind of life to live even now? I think so. Yeah. Furthermore, we have the promise connected with the, with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that all of God's faithful children will be raised. So we can all do happen to, have, happen to us what happened to Moses. Let us look at two summary statements. This first one from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 418. When they, that is Moses and Aaron, ang angrily cried, must we fetch water out of the rock? They put themselves in God's place as though the power lay with themselves, men possessing human frailties and passions, wearied that the continual murmuring and rebellion of the people, wearied with the continuing murmuring and rebellion of the people, Moses had lost sight of his almighty helper, and without the divine strength he had been left to mar his record by an exhibition of human weakness. The man who might have stood pure, firm, and unselfish to the close of his work had been overcome at last. God had been dishonored before the congregation of Israel when he should have been magnified and exalted. Patriarchs and Prophets 418, as you mentioned. I continue? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 479, continuing. Uh, uh, upon the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses was present with Elijah, who had been translated. They were. Now, let's, let's interrupt for just a second now. We're, we're way down into New Testament times now, and Jesus has gone up with three of his disciples to the top of this mount. We don't know where that mount is located, somewhere around the Sea of Galilee, and that's where he's transfigured. And who comes down to comfort him and to assist him? Moses, Moses and, and Elijah. Elijah. Moses and Elijah. So now we're talking about something that's happening 1,400 years later, okay? So they, that is Moses and Elijah, were sent as bearers of light and glory from the Father to his Son. And thus the prayer of Moses, uttered so many centuries before, was at last fulfilled. He stood upon the, quote, goodly mountain, end quote, within the heritage of his people, bearing witness to him in whom all the promises to Israel centered. Such is the last scene revealed to mortal vision in the history of what man so highly honored of heaven. Patriarchs and Prophets 479. Okay, I, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about that a little bit now, a little bit more now. I think Moses suffered in heaven. He suffered because he had to see what the children of Israel did despite all his leading and all his help and all his direction and so forth. I think he cringed. Why do you suppose, uh, as mentioned above, we do not know exactly how long Moses was in the grave read that. Can you imagine his disappointment as he observed uh, what happened to the children of Israel and to us down through the centuries? Why do you suppose it is not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament that Moses was resurrected from the dead? How would anybody know that Moses was resurrected from the dead? Only if God revealed it to them. Only if God revealed it to them, because Mo there's clearly nobody who went up there. Unless Moses had been instructed by God and he told it to Joshua, I suppose that's a possibility. But as, as far as knowing for sure, nobody, no human being was there. No one could, no one could, could report what they saw, clearly. Um, well, we know that there's a report, you know, way over at the next to the last book in the New Testament, the little tiny book of Jude. And who wrote the book of Jude? Jesus' brother. Jesus, one of Jesus' younger brothers. Stepbrother. Step older. Yeah. Older brother. Yeah, older. Yeah. The younger among the brothers, but older than Jesus. But to know that none of them believed in the Lord. Most up, and, up until the final week. Final week, yeah. right. So as far as we know, it is only in the book of Jude where we find the conclusion of the story of Moses. 
Without that, we would have a hard time explaining how Moses could have come down to the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, 4. As you review all that you know about the life of Moses, would you say that he was a true friend of God? Yes. Surely we would say that, wouldn't we? Did he have the right kind of faith relationship with God? Absolutely. I mean, think about what has happened to Moses. No, Moses murdered that Egyptian because of he thought he wasn't he wasn't being fair to the thing, to to the Israelite, and then he was discovered. And I mean, it was the word got out, and he fled, and way down to the land of Midian. And I'm sure that Moses thought at that point in time. It's all over for me. I was supposed to be the king of Egypt. It's all over for me. And there he was for 40 years out there uh, herding sheep. And then what happened? Go back. God says, yep. I've got a job for you. Go back to Egypt. So it's 40 years, 40 years, 40 years of his life. And I'm uh, considering my age, I'm always thankful when I think Moses began his major work at the age of 80. <laughs> still yeah. Be better, still be better than trailing around sheep. If you've ever had anything yeah. to do with sheep, there's nothing sillier than the sheep. Yeah. Remember that on at least one or probably two different occasions, Moses had argued for God's own reputation. Mm. What an incredible friend. Friends stand up for their friend's reputation. The, res the resurrection of the dead at the second coming is proof that God could have created man in the beginning. It completely wipes out the idea that we must have evolved from some one-celled one -celled cre sea creature. If God did not and could not have created man in the beginning, how could he possibly raise millions of human beings back to life at the second coming? I mean, think about it. If, we really, if someone believes that there's a resurrection possible in the future, there's no way you can deny, you know, his creation back at the beginning. It's just foolish. Notice the specific directions that God gave to Moses about the end of his life on this earth. Deuteronomy 32, 30, 48 to 52. The same day the Lord said to Moses, Go to the Ar Abarim mountains in the land of Moab, opposite the city of Jericho. Climb Mount Nebo and look at the land of Canaan that I am about to give the people of Israel. He will die on the mountain as your brother Aaron did on Mount Hor, because both of you were unfaithful to me in the presence of the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. When you were at the waters of Meribah, Near the town of Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, you dishonored me in the presence of the people. You will look at the land from a distance, but you will not enter the land that I am giving the people of Israel. Goodness Bible. So, what have you learned? What have we learned from this lesson about God's dealings with rebels and sinners? Pretty, pretty, pretty friendly, pretty awesome, I would say. Yeah, he, he forgives, but sometimes consequences have to be... Which is important because many of our Christian friends suggest that if you just are forgiven, you're going to go to heaven. Just uh, Forgiveness is justification, and that justification is all you need. You can go to heaven. No, Moses was forgiven, but he still died. What have we learned about death and resurrection? Well, we've just learned something about that. Have we learned anything about the great controversy? Anything about the great controversy from this lesson? Yeah. We need to represent God correctly. Rightly, mm -hmm. yes. And the great controversy is always between two, indi what, two individuals? Christ and Satan. Christ and Satan, and in, in, in cases in the Bible where he is specific, Christ is specifically in conflict with Satan, he is usually called what? Michael. 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 And what does Michael mean? Who is like God. Who is like God or the one who is like God. 
So uh, will Jesus Christ have to argue with the devil about every faithful follower who is resurrected at the second coming? <laughs> imagine how... He already how, showed that 2,000 years ago. That, imagine no. how, how long that, convert, that kind of thing would go on. Imagine what those conversations might be like. The book of Genesis begins in the beginning God created and ends with a coffin in Egypt. What an incredible summary of the results of sin. The book of Deuteronomy begins with Moses reviewing all that they had accomplished in the 40 years. They had conquered the lands of Og and Sion and taken over their entire territories. It ends with Moses dying and being buried by God. At that point, they were camping on the plain of Moab and Moses repeated to them the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the land of Canaan would be theirs. But Deuteronomy ends with the death of Moses and his burial. We know that that was not the end of the story. The entire scripture begins with creation and ends in Revelation with the new earth. So why do you suppose that there's nothing in the book of Deuteronomy included in chapter 34 where Joshua apparently talked about the death of Moses, about the resurrection of Moses? Are there any hints in what was caused by God about and what was said by God about his plans for Moses? And I thought this was very interesting. Deuteronomy 34, 6 says, No one knows his grave to this day. We do not have any evidence that any other being of Scripture was buried by God. Why that unusual situation? Deuteronomy 34, 5 adds these interesting comments about his death, saying it was according to the word of the Lord, which literally in Hebrew says, On the mouth of the Lord. An ancient Jewish commentary says that Moses died with a kiss from God, strangely reminding us of God breathing the life of the breath of life into Adam back in Genesis 2:7, thus suggesting uh, the miraculous recreation of Moses. Ellen White added these interesting words about his vision in the land before he died. Um, guess we're gonna let's try. Still another scene opens to his view, the earth freed from the curse, lovelier than the fair land of promise, so lately spread out before him. There is no sin and death cannot enter. There the nations of the saved find their eternal home. With joy unutterable, Moses looks upon the scene, the fulfillment of a more glorious deliverance than his brightest hopes have ever pictured. Their earthly wanderings forever past, the Israel of God have at last entered the goodly land. Again, the vision fades and we'll have to close there. You can read the rest of the story yourself. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful rehearsal of what happened to Moses at the end of his life and the glorious promise that it gives to us that if we're faithful, we can go ascend to heaven and live with you forever. May it be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.